Beneath every roaring train lies a story most people never notice, the silent evolution of the tracks themselves. But how did we go from shaky wooden planks to steel highways that carry bullet trains at lightning speeds? Let's uncover how railway tracks quietly reinvented the way the world moves. Before trains ever roared across the countryside, railways had their roots deep underground in the dark, muddy mines of the 12th century Germany. Miners faced a tough challenge, moving tons of ore through slippery tunnels. So what was their clever fix? Wooden planks laid on the ground, creating a smooth path for carts to roll over. Simple but revolutionary. It sparked the idea of guiding wheels along a fixed track. By the 1500s, engineers improved the system with pins to keep carts straight, and soon England joined in. The wooden wagonways of Shropshire, especially the Walletton Wagonway of 1604, marked the first real step toward modern railways. So how did these fragile wooden paths evolve into the iron monsters that powered the Industrial Revolution? As industries boomed in the 18th century, the humble wooden railway track was starting to show its limits. No matter how sturdy the timber, it simply couldn't bear the increasing weight of heavy wagons and the new steam engines. That's when iron entered the scene. In the late 1760s, the Colebrook Dale Company in England began attaching cast iron plates to wooden rails. Suddenly, tracks could handle heavier loads and last longer, a transformation made possible by steam-powered blast furnaces that churned out iron faster and cheaper than ever before. But progress wasn't a straight path. Two competing iron rail designs emerged. John Kerr's plateway system from around 1787 featured L-shaped iron plates on which carts with flat wheels ran. Then came William Jessop's edge rail system in 1789, used on the Charnwood Forest Canal extension. Jessup flipped the, the concept. Instead of relying on special rails, he put flanges on the wheels, which ran on smooth iron rails. This design proved superior. It didn't trap debris like plateways did, allowed easier road crossings, and quickly became the global standard. From muddy wooden tracks to glistening iron rails, the foundation for the railway revolution was set. Yet, as locomotives grew heavier, a critical problem arose. Rails made of cast iron cracked and broke under the pressure, causing delays, accidents, and costly repairs. Luckily, the solution came in 1820, thanks to John Birkinshaw of Bedlington Ironworks, who developed rolled wrought iron rails about 15 feet long each. Unlike cast iron, wrought iron was ductile, it could bend slightly without breaking, making it perfect for supporting heavier locomotives and cargo. For the first time, railway tracks combined strength and flexibility, pushing the industry into a new era. The next big leap came with steel. In 1857, Robert Forrester Mouchette used scrap steel from a failed Bessemer trial to create the first steel rails, which were installed at Darby Railway Station. They lasted over 16 years, far outliving iron rails. Meanwhile, Sir Henry Bessemer's 1856 invention made mass production of high quality steel fast and affordable. Innovations like open hearth furnaces and William Siemens's Landor Steelworks further boosted production, supplying durable steel rails to major lines such as the Great Western Railway. Modern rail steel is carefully engineered Iron with 0.40 to 0.80% carbon, 1.30 to 1.40% manganese, and sometimes alloying elements like vanadium, titanium, chromium, or tin, giving it incredible strength, toughness, and durability. From brittle beginnings to steel perfection, railway tracks had finally found a backbone strong enough to carry the world's progress. But if steel rails were so robust, what innovations would come next to make them even better? As railways began spreading across Britain in the early 19th century, engineers faced an unexpected dilemma that would ignite one of the fiercest technical rivalries in transport history, the gauge debate. The gauge 
refers to the distance between the inner sides of the two rails. And at first, there was no agreed standard. Every engineer believed their measurement was best. George Stevenson, often called the father of railways, was among the first to set the tone. While working in the coal mines of County Durham, he used a spacing of four feet, eight inches for his wagonways. When he built the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1825, he stuck to that same gauge. Later, for the famous Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the first inner city line, he made a small but crucial adjustment. An extra half inch of width to ease tight turns. That four feet, eight and a half inches would eventually become the world's standard gauge, but not without a fight. Then came Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the bold visionary behind the Great Western Railway. He wasn't convinced by Stevenson's narrow design. Brunel believed that a broader gauge, seven feet and one quarter inch, would offer smoother rides, greater stability, and room for larger, more powerful locomotives. His trains were indeed faster and more comfortable, but they came at a cost. Compatibility. Other engineers and railway companies had their own preferences too. The Monkland and Kirkintilloch Railway used four feet, six inches, while the Ulster Railway went with six feet, two inches. But here's the twist. Before long, Britain's growing railway network turned into a patchwork of mismatched systems. At break of gauge stations, passengers were forced to get off one train and onto another, while freight had to be unloaded and reloaded by hand. It was slow, costly, and chaotic. A logistical nightmare that made national rail travel nearly impossible. By 1845, the problem had become so disruptive that the government stepped in. The Royal Commission on Railway Gauges investigated the issue and recommended a single standard. The following year, the Gauge Act of 1846 declared Stevenson's four feet, eight and a half inches as the official gauge for new passenger railways in Great Britain. Even Brunel's Great Western Railway eventually conceded. By 1892, the entire line had been converted to standard gauge, marking the end of the so-called gauge wars. Decades later, in 1937, the International Union of Railways adopted 1,435 millimeters as the global standard gauge, ensuring that trains could move seamlessly across regions and countries. Still, some nations, like India, Russia, and parts of Australia, kept broader or narrower gauges to suit their terrain and transport needs. But the dream of a connected world riding on two parallel rails set 1,435 millimeters apart had finally been realized. Yet, the rails themselves were only half the story. What about the hidden heroes beneath them? The sleepers, the ballast, and the fastening systems that keep everything firmly in place? While the rails themselves often steal the spotlight, the real backbone of any railway lies beneath them, the supporting infrastructure. From the earliest wooden tracks to today's high-tech networks, sleepers, ballast, and fastenings have evolved dramatically, shaping how trains move safely and smoothly. Originally, sleepers, known as ties in North America, were almost exclusively made of wood. Oak, beech, and pine dominated, and for over a century, wooden sleepers accounted for around 90% of the world's rail infrastructure. They were simple, effective, and easy to work with. But as train loads grew heavier and environmental concerns became more pressing, engineers began experimenting with alternatives. In 1877, French gardener Joseph Monnier proposed steel-reinforced concrete sleepers, though early trials were unsuccessful. Practical concrete sleepers first appeared on the Alford and Sutton Tramway in 1884, and by 1896, America's Reading Company had deployed them on main lines. After World War II, timber shortages pushed Europe to perfect pre-stressed concrete sleepers, which could last 40 to 50 years, provide exceptional stability, and handle high-speed trains, though they are heavy and require mechanical handling. Steel sleepers also emerged, offering 30 to 40 year lifespans with less ballast needed, though they are prone to corrosion and less suitable for high-speed travel. Today, 
recycled plastics and composite materials are being explored as sustainable alternatives. Track ballast, the crushed stone that supports sleepers, has a fascinating history too. The term comes from nautical practices of using stones to stabilize ships. Crushed granite or limestone became standard because they are hard, durable, and drain water well. Ballast carries the load of passing trains, keeps tracks level, absorbs vibration, suppresses vegetation, and even insulates electrically. Fastening systems have evolved alongside sleepers and ballast. Early wooden rails used pegs or nails, but William Bridges Adams's 1842 invention of the fish plate revolutionized rail joining, providing smooth, continuous alignment. Modern concrete sleepers use sophisticated systems like the SKL tension clip, combining spring steel clips, rail pads, and guide plates to secure rails elastically while reducing vibration. Continuous welded rail represents the peak of modern track technology. Introduced in Britain in the 1960s, CWR eliminates bolted joints, reduces maintenance, improves ride quality, and enhances safety. Alongside it, automated tamping machines, predictive maintenance algorithms, drones, and IoT sensors now monitor and maintain track geometry in real time, ensuring that trains can travel faster and heavier than ever before. From simple wooden sleepers to intelligent, digitally monitored rails, the evolution of railway infrastructure mirrors the demands of increasingly fast, heavy, and frequent train traffic, a story of continuous innovation beneath the tracks we often take for granted. What do you think was the biggest breakthrough in railway evolution? Steel tracks, concrete sleepers, or magnetic levitation? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this journey through time, hit that like button and subscribe for more fascinating stories of how technology keeps the world moving.